Thanks for coming back. That was good. I didn't chase you away too badly. All right, so the second half of this presentation is about leadership for the common good. I'll get to the PowerPoint in a minute, but I thought we'd start with a little self-reflection. And if what I'm about to charge you with doesn't work for you because you're in a different mindset, turn into what works for you. I don't want to impose something that is absolutely useless on you. My intention in the next hour is to really get to a space where we talk about the kind of leadership needed to drive the vision I tried to share in the first hour forward. And each of you is a leader in your own way. We have people representing the archdiocese, people who are running school systems and schools. We have people at the building level, the system level. Everyone here is a leader in their own way. And in the classroom space, every teacher is a leader. In fact, the most important leader to drive classroom instruction every day so that kids learn what they're supposed to learn and they're excited about their learning and inspired to come back tomorrow and try again, right? So in this vein, do any of you have a Twitter profile? Right. So you're welcome to use your current one. If you don't have one and don't believe in it, you're not required to do this for real. If you like to just do something else that's better for you in the four minutes we're going to do this, do that. I'm going to give you a sheet of paper. We're going to use the back side of it for something else, unless you need another sheet of paper. We're going to give it to you there. But I'd love for you to see what I put down. You can, if you'd want to just change mine, it'd be fine, but I'd really rather <laughs> you work on yours. My profile says, our commitment to our children and seniors says everything about the health of our society. We should inspire every child every day. As a teacher, I came up with a slogan that helped me, and that was every child every day. That my job as a teacher was to provide an educational experience to everyone. Now, I came up short almost every day, but he brought me back tomorrow to try, which is what I like about this business, right? If you were to write something similar about your vision, either for yourself as a leader, or the organization you lead, or your role in the organization, whatever it is, you don't actually have to post this, obviously, but if you want to even just revise yours, what would you come up with to work on? So what would be your bottom line statement you'd like the world to see about your values as a leader? I know some of you are using this time to reflect, and that's its purpose, but just for the purposes of time, because you can be doodling while I'm talking. Does anybody come up with something they wouldn't mind sharing? It could be a rewrite of what you already had, which might just be one word away from brilliant. Uh, or it could be something new that you're thinking about that hasn't quite got itself teased out yet. Is there any vision you want to share? I ask my students in teacher education to come up with something that they would put on their desk to, that you wouldn't mind a student seeing that would exemplify the kind of teacher you want to be. And, but that's beautiful. Would, it, would you rather have, I don't really care if you learn, it's up to you. I mean, that, that might be appropriate for certain settings, but... I think that's a very different message you've just sent. Generosity and spirit. Wow. Excellent. Oh. Yeah, that's a wonderful example. Imagination. Think about, and, and I do this with hes hesitation because they're not perfect organizations, but three of the largest organizations in the world today, Facebook, Microsoft, and Google. We already talked about Google a little bit. Those two guys were at Stanford as post-grad students, but for no academic credit, they decided over the weekend they would download the internet. It's like, we got nothing to do this weekend, want to download the internet? And at that point, you almost could. It took them two weeks. So I think it would take two days. Because it was so good, Stanford invested and gave them some servers, and they linked some things together, and 17 years later, they actually probably run the world, if we think about it. They know everywhere you are. Either that or Apple does. I'm not sure which is better or worse. All right, so that wasn't because of their schooling they did that. It was because they got around smart people, and they used their imagination. In Facebook, was done as a social invention. I just want to keep track of all my friends and figure out what they're doing. And Facebook is what it is today. The largest interaction of networks in the world with people talking to one another. And if we use Microsoft, who gets dropped out of Harvard? Turn that window with his partner. So it's about getting around smart people and having imagination and learning how to cooperate. Some of those cooperation, if you saw the Facebook movie or read the book, is, wasn't all that good. Uh, they're all laughing on the way back. It wasn't a perfect enterprise. But my point is they use their imagination and hooking with other people to use theirs to build what amounts to three of the largest companies in the world that are bigger than most economies in most countries. So I love that. Those of imagination. 
That's really good. There's so many ways to go with that. When I work with kindergarten kids, just because I'm a high school teacher, I bring love for all the young kids, but not necessarily the savvy. So I try to teach them that you don't have to say everything that comes into your head, because five-year-olds say everything that comes into your head, in their head. And so I go, and all of a sudden one kid picked it up. You don't have to, and then all of a sudden I just have to look at that, and all of a sudden they're quiet. I haven't had to scold them at all. But if you're going to say something, make sure it's worth everybody hearing it. Really amazing, whether it's for kindergartners <laughs> all the way to this room <laughs> full of people. Wow. One great on the spot. Hold that thought. Revise it through today. If anybody comes up with something you'd like to share with this team, I know through the network we can do that. But at least share with me. I might borrow it. I'll give you credit. I'll just love it and not put it there. So how much have things really changed? This is Tropicana apple juice from the Charlotte, North Carolina airport last year. There's just a little speck of it. It's turned into pretty good rosé on the bottom, maybe. I'm not sure. Apple wine, I think. So I thought America did apples. If there's one thing we could say, you don't need to export, import, it's apples. We do apples. Australia does apples, right? Would you need Australia to import apples from another place? Aren't there lots of great apples? So this apple juice is in a plastic container, which is fossil fuel product probably from some place where we're sending fighting men and women to protect so we can get the fossil fuel and create the plastic. So in spite of that, where do these apples come from? And the label on the back indicates the percentages of the concentrated apple juice that by percentage of the first one is the most and the last one is the least, right? That's the way most food labels work today. So when you read this, you know sort of what's in it. So this says, that this contains apple concentrate from Germany, Austria, Italy, Hungary, Argentina, Chile, Turkey, Brazil, China, and the United States. Now that's not alphabetical order, that's the percentages of the amount of apple that's in apple juice sold in North Carolina. That's what's changed on our watch. That apple juice isn't even from one place. In fact, there's more apple juice from Austria than there is from the US when Johnny Appleseed is as American as anything else. So part of the vision that you're developing, I think, has to be framed around taking very old and traditional values that you just said, right? From curiosity to inspiration to love. I mean, that's not a new concept, but putting it in a forward-thinking mindset, in a leadership context. That's what this presentation is about, because we can't afford to lose a generation of young people who aren't fully inspired and spot on in their brilliance because of the way in which things are much faster. We're going to get to that in a minute. Alan Kay, who's an early innovator in the technology space, some give credit to Abraham Lincoln for this quote. This is one of these things that you could probably get wrong if you were uh, doing it for a publication. But Kay is the one who said it this way. And some of it is we've got to get kids seeing they're going to invent their future. Lots of ways to go with that. So I made a list of the allocation of duties of leaders. I may not have the right list, so let's just add to this, okay? I'm going to ask you to do something on the flip side of the paper or in another format or just in your mind if the task doesn't seem useful. So here's the list I came up with, but this might not be perfect. You're managing staff, taking care of administrative duties, crisis managing, you're meeting with your team inside your unit, you're meeting with people outside representing, you're taking care of email or the equivalent telephone, you're meeting with constituent groups, whether those are parents or the community or parishioners, um, you're, you're reading. Hmm. When's that happening? We're still what I get paid to do is read and give feedback. And I mostly answer email, so it counts as reading. And I get feedback and I push send. But the reflection, the mentoring, hmm. since all our profiles are professional plans for everybody, we want to be mentors. Uh, professional development for our own good. Management by walking around, the opportunity just to visit the colleagues who are in a nearby company or down the road at a different uh, organization you're responsible for. Staying healthy for yourself during the day not just during the holiday, uh, promoting excellence, like being a leader by example. What did I leave out that's some of the stuff you do that doesn't fit one of those categories? There's some other words you could put in there that aren't as polite. The junk and the stuff. And... Mm -hmm. If we call leading having three parts. One is sort of the inspiring part. The second is the administrative part, the taking care of the business. And the third is maintaining and being really good at number one and two. 
and you created a pie chart on the back of the sheet of paper you were working on your Twitter profile. And in an ideal two-week period, how much would you spend inspiring your staff, your team, your class, your constituents? How much would you in taking care of a lot of the administrative things? And how much would you on maintaining yourself being good at what you do, which is staying healthy, reading and reflecting, taking your own charge of your own sort of well-being and becoming the best leader. So one is leading, the other one's administering, and the third is making sure you can do one and two well. In a pie chart where you write percentages, so it's a little circle with a diagram, what we'll say is how much in an ideal, not current context, would it be 30% leading, 30% administration, and 40% taking care of you? This is not real. This is just hypothetical. If you'd write that down, and if you don't leave space for the second one, it's okay because we have more paper, and you can write it over it. When we finish today, I'm going to have you go back and put how much you really do that. See if I can change some of that, because your goal for 2015 will be your second one. See if we can make a New Year's resolution on reframing some of this. So what's your ideal mix of the balance of the work that you do, even if right now that seems not fathomable, because what you're being here today listening to me has put you 180 emails behind, 16 evaluations behind, and other tasks that you really should be attending to. The big conversation by HR directors where I come from is work-life balance, but most of the time the life part doesn't get operationalized. It's really a work balance between different chairs you're sitting in in different meetings. When I was chair of a department, my kids were very young, and they asked me what a chairperson was, and I didn't want to get into the English example of the big chair at the end, you sit in, what can be. I just told them I rotate where I sit every day, different meetings all day long. So, right, so the notion, that's part of this ducky movement that Australia doesn't have to continue, is taking the British and American examples of heart disease and of high stress and of forgetting our purpose to be leaders that inspire and do the other stuff in between, and we're excited about it every day, even if by Thursday there's a little bit of thinking it going on. So we don't want those duckies to hit this shore. I see great principals, great school district leaders, great school organizations in the independent schools, the Catholic schools, and the public schools, everywhere I've been in a year being here. Some of the best people I've ever met doing great work every day that don't feel like it because the wear and tear is getting to them, and they don't have the time or we haven't allocated our way of thinking about time that gets them saying, we could do it differently, somehow I know there's a way. And some of it is tactics that time management can teach us. I want to take us through more of a leadership visioning for the next few minutes on this, and hopefully it won't be a waste of that time I was just stealing from you. So the message in the first presentation is be wary of the ducky, be really afraid. And we might want to redefine the purpose of schooling, and I want to get to schools of education if we can, around this notion of a collaborative, global innovation age. And innovation meaning that we're ideas that enable us to meet our goals and improve the common good. I worked in an organization where a vice chancellor's definition of innovation was do more with less. We're going to cut your budget 20%. You've got the same expectations and greater for next year, go for it. The ABC is going to have to figure out how to do that. So this definition of innovation is slightly different. These is, this is ideas that enable us to meet our goals and improve the common good. First, we have to decide what our goals are. And my premise in the first is that it might be that the purpose of schooling is different. So keep in mind, I've tried to help us think about that, or you can substitute your words as well. So the three companies I mentioned a couple of minutes ago have mission statements. And those mission statements, Google's is organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful. Looks like they're on that one, right? Apple is bring the best personal computing experience to consumers around the world and make it its own religion. Like, I gotta have it, so lining up before it's even out. Facebook is give power to the people to share and make the world more open and connected. Wow. Netflix, which is a streaming service in the States that might not have made it here quite yet, 
Um, it's basically revolutionized the way people watch movies. Cloud-based tool on your watch, on your phone, in your hand, or in your house. You can watch anything anytime. We're going to put it there. Changing what it means to be any medium. And the cloud has done that for a little bit of a fee. 99 cents a movie in the States. And on Tuesdays, you can get one free. So this collaborative global innovation age changes the kind of leaders we need to be. Working together to solve problems, change the planet, helps us think about that. So in developing our motto or philosophy, I want us to come back toward the end and see if um, we changed it slightly. And I want to frame this around the notion of urgency, vision, and voice. Three themes that I want to share with you that if you were on my team, and I was newly hired, I would share with you, here's sort of my way of thinking about my role as a leader. I want to establish the urgency of the time we're in, the vision that I have that I want to shape with you, and the voice I want to represent us with outside of this organization to represent you in. Right? So those are the three big themes. And urgency, I'm going to try to do in a way that totally could be a disaster. I apologize in advance if you're embarrassed to know me in just about a minute. But I want to interview somebody you've already met this morning on the shores of the Hunter River and see if this interview helps frame this notion of urgency. To explain a little bit more about this potential, part of the reason I did this is the imagination that we have with technology even allows you crudely to present information in new and exciting ways, present your vision from the places you go. We have people who've been around the world just in the last few months. Did you do a video for your team where you explain what you got, what you brought back to your team? Live from the setting you were in off your iPad. Stream to YouTube before you got home or not. We're gonna have our teachers. It's sort of a different way of that teddy bear in a backpack that primary teachers use that they, on holidays kids bring around and bring home and they write in the diary. What about all the places you and your staff have been that come back and say, not only am I going to tell you about it, I'm going to show it to you, or I'm going to interview. Terry's just been in India, Dan's just been in California, some of the rest of you have been all around the world. Let's bring it to us and explain ourselves from those settings. The G20 Summit, if you could hear it through the wind, just last week. Education, not the agenda. The middle column here is the agenda. And where it looks like it's education, like reforming global institutions, that's the financial industry. The first item is anti-corruption. So the 20 powers of the world economically got together. Schools, teachers, education, not even mentioned. And I look at this and go, wait a minute. The number one driver of success, if you hold poverty aside, which is a big thing to hold aside, and women's rights and re-empowering people to their own future in developing countries. But if you say in developed countries, education is the key. It's the way forward. It's the one thing we know works with the least investment and the best results. We get more out of high quality early childhood education than we do any other investment we make in society. So how could this be? What kind of leadership vacuum is there that none of the leaders of the world would come and make education the agenda? And that's where I sort of came up with this idea that innovation is the new coal, that in fact it's going to replace the mines and the mills as the mine, and that's the spirit of the urgency that I'd like us to bring forward to our staff in your own words. I'm doing it in my gimmicky way, talking to myself. But you can bring in the sense that we don't have this generation of Australians or anybody can be a slacker. Because you know right now that part of the reason the Abbott administration is happy to cut the budget is we have a few too many people possibly taking advantage of services that don't deserve them. Now how we decide that, that may not have been done well, but we do have a very large budget for paying people not to do very much. And wouldn't it be great if through education we got them doing something? Because the jobs that they're prepared for don't exist. Or if they do exist, there's not room for them anymore. They're being replaced by the innovation age. We can only have so many coffee shops, by the way. So that's another piece. It looks like that's the alternative. So the my 5,000 jobs were lost just last week in Hunter. 5,000 jobs gone. So we have to take this with a sense of urgency that it's going to be through education. That is the way forward. I'm working with some young people in a couple of communities north of here that are in, in dire straits. Their father, their uncle, their grandfather have never worked. And they're being raised in a family where education just doesn't get on the radar. They want their best for the child. They just don't have education as the priority. It's mostly survival. Meanwhile, Khan, 
the Khan Academy, some of you may use stuff from Khan or other equivalents. We can log on to Khan now and get as much math or science as I got through my whole school. At real time for me, whenever I want to learn it. And Khan's website says, you can learn anything. The metaphor of my school is some of you will learn some things. Right? You can learn anything right now. And it's done very old school. They're talking videos. You learn how to solve an equation or how electricity works or how to set up a circuit. You could rewind it a hundred times. You might learn it. Most of us didn't learn it the first time, even if we got a highest mark or an A on it ourselves. So that's what we're competing with, but I don't look at it as competition. I look at it as opportunity that we can find the time we have to really get powerful learning experiences because the repetition of that can happen offline, at home, or where kids have time to practice, even in the school day when the teachers are doing professional development. So as an example of one of these concepts that we may or may not have been taught, if your phone still has charge and you're still with me, let's solve this problem. See if you can remember how to solve this problem. All right, so it looks like six of us in teams have gotten the lead of number one and three number nine. Did anyone who didn't have their mobile or do this have a want to give me an answer with a shout out? One, three, uh, three. I right, mean, one, three, nine. Everybody's lost twenty-six, so we're ruling that one out. So the, this is an order of operations problem, right? If we hadn't ever used order of operations since, did we really need to learn it? Part of our urgency is, are we teaching stuff that is still not clear while we learned it? You probably got all this right. Let me, let me show you how to solve this, and then in 20 years you won't remember anyway, so it's okay, right? So we have to solve in the order of operations, you do the parentheses or the brackets first. So the first thing we do is one plus two to get three. That part most of you did, right? You might remember, take care of the parentheses first. But then we go back to the beginning, and we take care of the in order. If there's division and multiplication, we take care of them left to right, and then we do addition and subtraction. So the reason we did addition first is it's in the parentheses. So 2 plus 1 is 3. That 2 parentheses 3 becomes a multiplication problem. So our first thing is to go back to 6 divided by 2, take care of that, which is 3, times the 2 plus 1 is 3. The answer is 9. The answer is 9. Now, 1 is a very susceptible foil. It actually makes sense, because, but order of operations actually has us go back, and sometimes we forget the parentheses actually means that's a multiplication problem with the number next to it. All right, we could do this out at lunch. If you're so convinced, we'll practice other ones. My point on this is to catch us once again on if this is something that was really important for us to know in year six, seven, eight, nine, and most of us didn't know it. Why did we learn it? The urgency is looking at the curriculum to what's really valuable. I'm not saying it isn't important. I know engineers use this stuff every day, but most of us didn't even know it. So we've got to challenge ourselves that our vision has to be something we're going to use as well. All right. Let's get into the vision part. That's the urgency. A way different world that we're in. Apple juice isn't even apple juice from your own country. If you had to define what kind of leader you are, and I'll give you the, the fourth option of other in a moment. But one of the founders of leadership, particularly educational leadership, was Kurt Lewin in 1939. Some of you may quote Lewin's work as psychologist. They really thought about the psychological options that people have when they're leaders. The first is to be authoritarian. That's a dictatorial person. It's sort of my way or the highway person. A delegative person would be uh, much more laissez-faire. I worked for a principal one time that we never really saw it. Right? His deputies did the work, and I guess it was all good, but he never really knew what was happening. Everybody else did, and no, he didn't. <laughs> and participative would be more democratic, where you're trying to be part of a team which is solving problems together and making decisions together. So if you're more authoritative, delegative, or participative, pick that one. If there's another category you prefer, other would be the answer there. Because part of Understanding your vision is understanding the kind of leader you hope to be. And I think some of what we heard in the 
the slogans and mottos that you were sharing a little earlier indicate to me at least one of these probably leading or leaning. But if you're not satisfied, other I put on this one for a change. So in shaping your vision for 2015, the kind of leader you are, I think, matters a lot. My assumption is that those that are saying authoritative and participative are, that's their sort of default. There's some bottom line things that are, that are that's the way they lean. But for anyone who said authoritative, do you want to explain your answer? Good, by defining authoritative instead of authoritarian, you claim that space and say these are the things that qualify you for the role. You have a skill set to take charge. There also might be situations where there's bottom lines that of acceptability and non-acceptability of certain things that you're pretty clear about, right? That's authoritative. For participative, we have the majority, of, that looks like the majority. Um, that would be indicative of some of the quotes we heard earlier. What would be one of the hallmarks of participative from what you've come up with? Is that as participative as possible? You know, when it's possible, you try to get as much input as you can. It's that sense of shared yes, wisdom with, with yep. and their job. Excellent. Yeah. Enjoy responsibility. Yeah, shared responsibility for the outcomes. Sometimes I believe you should lead from the front of the boat. This is a little boat in the river where actually steering's in the back. So you're saying this is the way we're going, and other people will just grab it and steer that way. Sometimes you're going to have boat steering. So my belief is it's contextual. There are certain times, there are certain bottom lines where you're in charge and you're going to make that decision. Moral decisions, I think, and ethical decisions have to be that. We're going to use every nickel and every dime appropriately. We're not going to misspend the money of the people who are funding us. We're not going to make a decision that we think might be harmful to children in this space or whatever it might be. We're going to do good. There's other things where the options may be enough similar where lots of participation will be helpful. There's also sometimes not time. Sometimes there's confidentiality. So I think it is situational. Part of the reason I'm raising this, as you look at your vision for the future, I really want you to be clear about that to your constituents, the kind of leader you're intending to be. I've come to the School of Education after a profoundly strong and able and very noble leader has guided our school for many years. In that is a culture that expects a certain kind of leadership. I'm not that kind of leader all the time. It's important for me to define what access to me represents. Because people assume that there's not enough time. Well, there's never enough time. If you email or tweet me or contact me, I'll get back to you. I'll get back to you as soon as I can. If I'm presenting at BBI today, it might be on the train home, right? But I'll get back to you. Anytime. I'd rather you texted me on Saturday than wait until Tuesday and said, I hate to trouble you. Because it's not trouble. I'd be worried about something you needed me for. That may not be your style, but it's important to communicate your vision so that you are clear to your folks about the kind of style you're operating with and the context at which you might be any of these. What you will allow and won't in allow sounds very uh, parental, but in certain occasions we just can't allow. I don't tolerate anything which gives students bad service. If somebody's deliberately not giving students feedback in weeks on the assignment, we got to do better than that. Shouldn't we be the example? We're a school of education. We're going to wait six weeks to give back something that was supposed to be back in two or three. So I don't really tolerate that well. I have sort of a bottom line that says, students, come first, let's serve them, and we'll take care of the other stuff when we can. Now, that sounds very authoritative, and I don't really mind. But how we find the solutions in Blackboard to do things smarter, because Blackboard was down for three of those weeks in there, by the way, so everybody had an excuse, is going to have to be participative, because I don't know how to fix those things. But together, we can figure it out. So I encourage you to build into your platform, your statements, your thinking, your profile, the kind of leader you expect to be, and be proud of whatever it is. I talk about leading from the front and the back of the boat at different times. You can use your own examples and are probably very successful. It also could be a growth area if delegative is not one of those. Because some of us are overwhelmed because we don't trust the person who's actually paid to do the job to do the job. So we do it for them. And that either is one of two problems, our own issue or it's bad staffing issue. And it may be both, but it's probably that trust means a change might be good.
if that person is just not up to it. I've had to do that inside my organization. Somebody in a very key role just really basically didn't do the job this year on a lot of important details I won't get into because you, you might know this person. Uh, and they're no longer going to do that work. And we came to it amiably in working it out. It's just not the right role for them. So you might have to make the tough call to get the right person so you can delegate if that's part of what your vision needs so it's not all on you. So some of you read Tom Friedman's work in 2005 called The World is Flat. Did that come up in any of your work around professional development? Where Friedman, who's a columnist for the New York Times, but has toured the world, wrote a book about the flat world. And the flat world indicates sort of what Walmart and Woolies and Kmart and Target have done. They found suppliers all around the world who will get people for very little money to make stuff. And they'll get it shipped to wherever you want so that somehow you can sell it cheaper at home than it was to pay somebody at home to make it. At Walmart in the States, you can buy a t-shirt for $2 because they paid somebody 20 cents an hour to make it in Vietnam. That supply chain that they've done means they've taken all the market forces in between of middlemen out and they own the whole chain. Meanwhile, couriers can take something right now and ship it to Los Angeles tonight if you're willing to pay for it. That cup of water could be in Los Angeles. Well, it'd be, it would be tonight because we gained a day back going. So, so we also have ability to move money invisibly behind the scenes. The flat world has changed everything. Freeman's new context is the fast world. And that's the sense that I want to bring to the vision you bring that relates to the urgency that I tried to share. As leaders, we can't wait for this too shall pass. I'm sure a lot of people are assuming in the public sphere that the DEC and Bostis will have changeover when the election happens in March and we'll have new rules. So we just wait on it. It won't matter. We can't wait on it. We're going to have to get on top of it, proactive about it, in part because of all the things I've already shared about. We can't lose a generation of kids waiting around for the politics to get right. So he says we're in the middle of three climate changes, the digital, the geoeconomical, and the ecological changes that involve global economics, Moore's law, and climate change all happening now in a spin that is extraordinary. So what we have is the global economy is moving so quickly where governments are almost second to multinational corporations in driving the world geopolitics. Right? What's in the interest of the aerospace industry or what's in the interest of the coal or, or oil industry, what's in the interest of Facebook and Google now and, and any of the high-tech firms seems to transcend. The Europe and the European Union are trying to decide should Google spin off its own company so that privacy rights in one space of the world could be different than the rest. Fascinating geopolitics, all happening real time. Because right now you could be online texting with anybody in the world, shipping money to anybody in the world, purchasing any in the world, and running a company literally off the tools in our hands. That's incredible. Meanwhile, Moore's Law is the doubling of information every year. That's the speed and the size of the capacity to store information and process that information, taking the zeros and ones and spinning them quickly. So with that doubling, just in the last 10 years, we've created this very rapid pace of change so that somehow on this thing right here, or what's in your pocket, we can do most transactions that we need to do. I can mark in Blackboard right here. I don't have to log in anything else. I can make a video and embarrass myself putting it up from the Hunter River, right? I can do almost anything on a tool because it's processing information so quickly and storing it so well that I don't need a big device. I don't even need a lot of expertise. And the third is, for whatever the cause of climate change your belief system allows, we are the hottest the planet has been in 100,000 years, and the extremes of Mother Nature are more extreme. Some of it because we know, based on CNN, we know what's happening around the world, and some of it actually because it is more extreme. It just snowed six, week, six feet of snow in Buffalo last week. Never has in early November, mid-November, it snowed six feet. And you know from the fires last year, that happened uh, from the tragedy just up between here and Newcastle that took place. Many of your friends, neighbors, families were in jeopardy, lost property. It was followed by the rainiest day on November 20th in New South Wales history. So in one few week period, the most rain and the most fires, the earliest, and in Bloomington, Illinois, the strongest tornado that has ever hit that far north in November in recorded history, anywhere in the world, took place, a category five tornado. 
all happening. The speed at which things are changing creates the sense that we have to get our urgency and vision clear because we have to get some of these problems solved so that kids have the life that we would like them to lead. We leave them in great hands and the world is a better place. This is spinning much more quickly than linear change of the past. So here is what Friedman says are the drivers of, uh, in the challenges that could be, I'm saying could be our curriculum. Wouldn't it be weird if there was no curriculum at all for next year? And we were charged with the archdiocese to develop the curriculum. There's no KLAs, there's nothing. We're just now in charge today. I would just start here because it's just weird enough that it doesn't look like the current curriculum. And we have resilient infrastructure, affordable health care, sustainable environments, manageable debt, adaptable institutions, lifelong learning opportunities for new jobs. That would be our KLAs in the fast world. You can see a lot of math and science and history. You can see a lot of need for creativity in the arts. It doesn't say that, but wouldn't it be interesting to use this as the drivers of change in our vision? And if it wasn't that extreme, if we weren't going to get that crazy, could we take the current curriculum, at least sneak some of this in, so that at least it looks like we're preparing kids to be the problem solvers collaboratively for the future? This looks like job security for people to prepare themselves around affordable health care, uh, adaptable institutions. There's a lot of finance, and mathematics, there's a lot of logistics, a lot of web and cloud-based tools. Uh, really interesting to build infrastructure that would make it through a cyclone as well as a flood, as well as a heat wave. All the new materials we need to be adaptable in the future. Manageable debt, I'm gonna give us an example. If we were teaching debt right now, you realize that debt keeps rich people rich and poor people poor. In the United States today, to go to the university, either you get a scholarship because you're really bright, or you borrow money. And if you're coming a teacher, and you go to Duke University to be a teacher, where it costs $65,000 a year for four years, are you going to go $250,000 in debt to teach in North Carolina, where the starting salary is $33,000 a year? Think about incredible debt. Now go to the developing world, where debt is so extreme. So if we were going to teach debt, and debt was part of our scheme, I might work with Kiva.org. And Kiva is one of these organizations that is a micro-loaning organization. Anybody given money through Kiva before? Or no Kiva? Kiva was a couple of folks, I believe they were doing missionary work, and when they left they were worried their work might leave behind, they wouldn't leave a legacy. So they formed a website, which has become an organization where you can now give money to people all around the world together. So here's somebody in Kyrgyzstan, there's people in Samoa, there's Margaret in Uganda. So Margaret wants $925. Let's see what Margaret wants to use this for. So if we were kids learning about debt and debt management, we might now Read about Margaret. First of all, where's Uganda? What's its capital? What's its needs? What's Australia's interests? We've got a lot of stuff we could learn about Uganda. How they perform in the World Cup? Any Ebola there? Margaret lives in Kampala. She's married and has five children, all of whom are attending school. Then look out, um, not look after her family member. She's a business selling cereals, and she's been selling them. She's requested $900 to buy more grounds and nuts for sale. So what happens is capital, we've confused, and cap capital's having the resources to sell something. It's the car and the lot to sell. So the money that buys the capital means I could sell you this cup if it were mine to sell. So if you run out of supplies, you have to go into debt to buy more supplies before you can sell stuff. What if you could get a loan from you and me and be debt-free? You could pay us back in the next year a little bit at a time. If we could do really good ideas and fund them, we could have the world improve because debt is taken out as opposed to 6% interest, 12% interest, or with some loan sharks around the world, 200% interest, 2,000% interest, or I'm going to take your cow, or I'm going to take your daughter. In some cultures, it's that extreme. So if she needs cereal, she can't afford to get it from the bank or the loan shark or the guy down the street. But if, what if 10 of us give $25? What if 20 of us give $25? 
we'll build this group sharing process that, ne that it is. And since I've logged in, I have a little remaining uh, equity in, because once you loan to people, they pay you back, you can just reloan it. And I, if we had more time, I'd show you all of what um, we can do with this. But we're just going to give Margaret as an example. If this was a full-fledged unit or lesson, we're going to give her $25 as part of the team of people around the world. Now, I'm risking that the NGO out on the ground in Uganda has vetted her. All right, so right there, Margaret has now, we're part of the team helping Margaret. If we turn this into a massive lesson on debt, debt prevention, equity, maybe kids would come out more informed about it, but we'd also help the world in the same time in one lesson. And in the time, we could have collaborated. I have enough money, we could have chosen four people to give to. When they pay me back, I can take it back into my checking account, or what I can do is pay it to somebody else and pay it forward. So I probably put $400 into Kiva and given out two or $3,000 worth of loans because they just roll over and you pay something. Wow, we could teach a lot of stuff that's future thinking and help students learn about debt the old-fashioned way, which is it's not something you want to get into. Because most of us in the States now are in such debt from our postgraduate programs, it's taking us our whole careers to get out of it. My daughter got a partial scholarship from the University of North Carolina. I was able to save for the first two years. She paid for half of the last two. But in the last two, because it's 30000 60000 we still owe $45,000. She's a year out of school. I'm paying it for her because I'm not going to let her be a teacher. She teaches kindergarten. I'm not going to be a teacher and have that debt on her shoulders. So debt keeps us down as middle class families and poor people have to go into way too much debt or sacrifice dreams. There's a lot of curriculum just in that that I skipped through really quickly, but I also, we just made a difference. We could meet Margaret, we could know about Uganda, and we could help a woman help her family be successful and sell some cereal. That's the connections we can make that are just a click away using the technologies that we have. This might be a little small font for you guys to read in the back. This was a Nokia manager in Finland in the 90s. And the skill set that's needed is somebody who doesn't know as much content as they know how to work with people and somebody who can really have original ideas, use their imagination, inspire people. This seems to be accidents when it happens. Or our best students, or our best student teachers, we take credit for them and call them our shining stars. We give them accolades at the end of the school year. But they were awesome. We just, we just helped them be awesome. But they were probably going to be. It's about getting everybody to this place that they see the world that way. That vision for your organization is crucial because if it were easy, we wouldn't need you. Right? If every kid was woke up in the morning waiting to be inspired and excited and thrilled to learn, um, we wouldn't need it. So the good news is they need us, but we've got to remind ourselves that they need us as much on Thursday as they did on Monday, and they need as much next Thursday as they did this one, and in three more weeks, they keep coming back. All these kids, they just come back all the time. It's just like a lot of kids all the, all the time. And we've got to get that resiliency. So here's another way to think about vision. And some of you may have seen this awareness test in other forms over the last few years. But this is another way to think about it. So in this little device, we're not texting or clicking. We're counting the passes that the team in white makes. All right. Are you watching? Right. The other answer was nine when we were doing this multiplication of division. What's this answer? Twelve? 13? Anybody get something else? Anybody see anything else? Anybody see something else that hadn't seen this before? I saw him passing to himself before it started. Okay. Yeah, well, that's, see, when you get really smart people, that could be a correct answer. Because how many passes is a team? If you're a team, I like that creativity. In this case, we're counting passes to another person, but that's a good clarifying question. So you saw something else as well? I thought I saw... Two, two balls going. Okay, cool. So let's see. The answer is 13. But did you see the moonwalking bear? Oh, did we see the moonwalking bear? You did. You saw it. You've done this before or you saw it this time? I've seen the gorilla one. Aha, uh -huh. very similar. So there's a good point to that. So you're well educated to be observant. Did you get 13? I didn't count the ball. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Perfect. All right.
right, so those of you who didn't see the bear, watch over here. This is not a trick. See that guy walking across the screen? All right, so that's not trick photography. It was the first time as well as the second. So this guy in the bear suit's walking across the screen. The smartest people, those really well trained, know how to focus on the right answer. You're very well trained. You were told to watch the white team. You complied very well. You got 13. Those are your high-end students getting high marks, high HSCs. They're the ones we'll take credit for. And we still need those kids to get 13 because, you know, the world does have some right answers. But simultaneously, maybe the second time around. So we can't forget the 13 part. We need to see why are we doing this. If we're getting 13 to be right, for no apparent reason other than I'm supposed to, while the world is going very fast in the Friedman terms, where the economies of the world, the storage of information, the access to information, both good and bad, and the, the climate of the world is changing in such a way that could impact the lives of everyone who lives around a coastal environment in the world. Oh yes, that's 98% of everyone in Australia could be impacted dramatically just in our lifetime by what's happening. Those three factors make it really important that we also look at the big picture, or the guy in the bear suit. Are we training kids enough to look at both? Sure, we want you to solve this, we want you to be precise, but we also want it to be in a context of why we're doing it. I think that does it about as well as I've tried to do most of the session here today. So. Let's spend the last three or four minutes getting to the big to da of this leadership part. So that's urgency and vision. Now what about voice? My belief is you can only influence change if you're in the room. There's a lot of people you may work with who are really smart, really talented. They're just totally obnoxious when they get in a group setting about almost anything because they're so determined to have their point. It almost doesn't matter what the agenda is. They want that. They really can't influence change. You wouldn't delegate them to go to a meeting on your behalf. They're really not the person you're envisioning. So this is me saying we really also want to be collaborative enough that in the space we're in, whether it's with a parent group, a church group, uh, a political group, a series of community members, that they actually want us to be around to influence that change. In higher education, we're rather terrible at it because quite often we have right answers to other people's problems. And we don't understand that we're part of the problem as well as the solution. So my notion of leadership for the common good and my notion of voice is that we all have to have ESP, right? Extrasensory perception. And ESP fixtures into this spinning world as well. And this is, again, attributable just to my funky brain. Empowering empathy is the E. We have to be kinds of leaders people want to be led by. And empathy is one of the missing pieces. The mental health issues of my staff are the number one time I'm spending now. And I don't speak for you, but in most school leaders sit with, it's the health of their team that is taking their time. Small issues to large issues, life and death matters. Most of it, not very good. Things that have confronted them or they're confronting. Pretty shocking, and I bet it's as true at BBI as it is at any of the schools represented here. The empathy that it takes to be the leader who is so interested that they want to make sure their staff are okay is as important as the actual stuff we do, because we'll never have a better team than we have. And the intellectual capacity, when it walks out the door, will replace, but it won't be what we have now. Sound systems, that's the administrative part, right, that I shared with you earlier when we were doing the little pie chart. And purposefully proficient, just to keep this oration going on. So you've got to be actually good at number one and two. Right? So I'm not sure if that sticks as you're thinking about your vision for, for uh, your Twitter profile or your pie chart. We're going to come back to that in just one moment. So we have to inspire people, get the behind-the-scenes work done, completed with sort of no worries. And we have to be great at what we do. That's the voice part as well, because too often leaders will complain you know, I just couldn't get to email today. And I, what are we talking about? Everybody's busy. Your job is to inspire, help them get their work done, and to be really good at it. And then to have some puppy you talk to that you can complain to offline, right? We all have to have that outlet, whatever that is. Hopefully it's not a partner who's heard it all before. They quite often will be your former partner. 
Right, so this urgency, vision, and voice connection is the value added I'm bringing to this conversation with a reminder that General Custer, one of the famous American military leaders, was about to go forth at a little place called Little Bighorn and kill the American Indians. And he said there weren't enough Indians in the world to defeat the Seventh Cavalry just before he got his head taken out. Uh, I look at this metaphorically to if we don't find this urgency, vision, and voice, educational institutions as we've run them are not really going to be able to stay the same way for another generation. We have to reinvent them, reframe them around a new purpose. Whatever you bring to that can be very different than what I've tried to share today, but I'd love it to be something which gets us in the spirit of what this organization's about, what the archdiocese and the schools you represent are about, and about really where we need to lead society without doing it from the back seat, that we could do it from the driver's seat. Just in our lifetime, we've gone from vinyl to the cloud, and we may still be operating things as if we're in vinyl. Now, I know it's hip to have records again. Some people believe it sounds better, and maybe it does. It's just cool to go retro. But in terms of the innovation age we're in, we're in a cloud-based world still running it as if it's vinyl or 8-track. And the 8-track I had in my car, I had a 1968 Mustang that was as good as you could get. It only went 60 miles an hour. That's 110K, right? It's like, whoa, that's pretty fast. It, it's the only speed it went. You just... <laughs> It, I had an 8-track in that. When they came out, it melted in the summer. So I think we might be operating in melted 8-track tape style in terms of urgency, vision, and voice. And anybody with CDs knows that actually that's actually old school. All you need is access to the cloud for everything you do. We need high-quality programs apprenticed by experts delivered with the best pedagogy available. And that delivery system now doesn't matter because you can get it just by plugging into the cloud. If you needed a quote to bring to your team, this one by Young Zhao, and he's just a creative, amazing guy at the University of Oregon involved in online education and creativity, terrific leader, uh, really great colleague. He um, points this out, and I think it might be to help some people pass the fact, well, that's the way we've always done it. Um, well, there's going to be this thing called bronze, and even after that, there might be this thing called Google. One more little video, and then we're going to finish with seeing if you have any modifications to what you've done. Let's see if we can find our piano. There we go. So how does this look in practice? Here's one example that you could bring to your team and see if you like it as much as I do. This is Stockholm, Sweden, and it's an innovation contest sponsored by Volkswagen. So in this example, 66% of people now use the stairs instead of, I use the escalator less and use the stairs. If we create schools that have this common purpose of collaboration, this notion of innovation, and in a global context, we get people moving. If our problem we were solving was around getting people moving more, we just have two-thirds more people using and moving upstairs, and it's actually more fun. The one part I worry about some of the seriousness that we brought to this high-stakes agenda is that it's taken the fun out of the educational enterprise. That's actually an interesting problem to solve with fun results that actually because everybody's better off. We're moving more. We also bring in the visual and performing arts that have been in some cases marginalized. There's so much engineering. There's so much creativity built into solving a problem of getting people to move more and possibly take the steps. With the escalator still there as an option if you can't, if you're physically impaired, or if you've just done that 10 times and you're on your way to work. That kind of level of spirit, I think, is this notion of leadership for the common good, that we also have to bring a sense of fun to the urgency, vision, and voice to make it this human enterprise that it actually really is. All right. So in this session, I've tried to guide us toward thinking the kind of leader we want to be. Would you peek out that statement we wrote at the beginning uh, that might be your Twitter profile or just might be good food for thought? See if it changes at all in the last hour, anything you might want to look at, and see if a new diagram for how you would propose in 2015 to use your time, whether you use the pie chart or just the things you think you might be able to delegate a bit more or get more participation in if you'd like, if there's any takeaways you don't want to lose before we call it a day.